The indie gaming sphere has been thriving recent years. You've seen the success of games like Signalis and Hollow Knight. There's one indie studio that doesn't get as much attention as those games I mentioned, but still has quite the dedicated following. It's Project Moon. Project Moon is a Korean game studio found in 2016 by Kim Ji Hoon, who serves as the main writer and director for their games. Their motto is Wealth and Honor, based on the two main things Kim Ji Hoon wished to obtain, which they already may have by now. They start with humble beginnings with their debut game Lobotomy Corporation in 2018, and have grown because of word of mouth, and have most recently released a dungeon crawling gacha game called Limbus Company, which had a hundred thousand players at launch, an unexpectedly high number that even crashed the servers. Aside from the games, Project Moon has also produced some webcomics and other side materials that expands on the interconnected world of their games. They even have their own company themed restaurant in South Korea called Ham Ham Pang Pang. Honestly, I haven't gotten into their games until recently, but they have quickly become my most recent fixation. These games have a certain passion and humanity behind them that I find refreshing. They're willing to challenge their players while also experimenting with different gameplay styles every time, something other developers seldom do. All of this combined with a shared universe acting as something like the works of Type Moon, a world filled with lore, intrigue, and mysteries that are still being unraveled as we progress further in these games. I want to talk about what makes these games so special, and if you haven't played any of these games, why you should. Let's get started. First up, we have Lobotomy Corporation, Monster Management Simulation. It's exactly what it sounds like, a game about managing monsters. These monsters are inspired by creatures from the SCP Foundation and Lovecraft, but there are more influences than you'd think. Many are based on fairy tales like Snow Queen, yet others are from Wizard of Oz like Scarecrow Searching for Wisdom. There's even a bit of Japanese horror in The Lady Facing the Wall. There's some really unique ones like Censored, which is a massive sensor bars. It doesn't literally look like this, but you aren't allowed to perceive its true form because it's implied that it would drive you mad if you did. You take the role of the new manager of the Lobotomy Corporation, who have these creatures called abnormalities that they use to extract energy called Encephalon. The basic gameplay loop revolves around sending employees to work with these abnormalities, meet your daily Encephalon quota, while also trying to handle miscellaneous side tasks and deal for deals. You may have heard about the difficulty of this game. It's rather infamous. The game expects a lot from the player. Each abnormality has their own unique mechanics, many of which can instantly kill your employees, control them, or produce other disastrous effects. Figuring out these mechanics and what manner of work is best for an abnormality is a matter of trial and error. There are four different types of work you can perform on an abnormality. Instinct, repression, insight, and attachment. Depending on their malady, some you can use all of these types to work on, while others you will need to use a specific one to avoid casualties. Initially, you don't have any information on a new abnormality, so you have to figure out their likes for yourself. Once you do start working with them, you can purchase more info with the resources you've gained and fill out the database entry. Filling it out will not only reveal some secrets that you might not have figured out, it also gives you passive bonuses when working with those abnormalities, and the ability to get their unique ego weapons and armor. If you mess up their mechanics, they can escape in what's called a breach and go on a rampage throughout their facility. Putting down these rampaging abnormalities can be quite the trial. Some aren't too bad or can be completely avoided, while others can turn your employees into paste. Getting employees to work with them can in itself be dangerous, as they deal damage just by performing work with them. Sending a low level employee to work with an abnormality that can deal high damage can lead to their death. Besides normal abnormalities, you also come across tool abnormalities. These are generally beneficial and can do things like increase stats of employees, but often at a cost. For instance, You Must Be Happy is a tool that can buff the stats of an employee as long as you pay attention while they're using it and tell them to stop the machine at the right time. If you mess up, the employee will get debuffed instead, and if an employee uses it too much in a single day or gets too many buffs, they'll die. So tools like this add a bit more in micromanagement, but can be worth it depending on the situation. Some, like the backwards clock, are vital for certain parts and strategies. As you get further in the game, you'll expand the facility and choose new abnormalities to take. This is where the quasi-roguelike elements come into play. You choose between three abnormalities, but it's random. It's impossible to get every abnormality in a single playthrough. Each playthrough is unique in a sense, as you will probably end up with different abnormalities, or familiar ones in different departments. One thing that's interesting about this is that you can run into some really bad combinations of abnormalities in the same department. For example, having yin and yang together. They go together like fire and oil, which is to say that having both is to cause a whole host of problems for your facility. 
or having Burrowing Heaven and Shenanden Frider next to each other, two abnormalities of polar opposite mechanics. One where you need to watch them while being worked on, or the other where you can't look at them when they're being worked on. Funny things like that can happen, and it could potentially be frustrating for those choosing blindly. Fortunately, the game is fairly forgiving about allowing you to go back to previous checkpoints you get every 5 days, so you don't have to restart from day 1 every time. You're expected to go back and repeat things often, especially if you want to see every abnormality and unlock the true ending. The game allows you to keep the weapons, armor, and information you have gathered when you reset or go back, so it can make earlier days a lot easier. Not only do you have to manage these abnormalities, you also have to survive daily ordeals. These are little events that will happen throughout the day to ensure that things don't get too peaceful. These can include creatures that go around killing employees, or weaker creatures that teleport around and cause abnormalities to breach. As the game progresses, these ordeals will only get more difficult. They're a real pain to deal with depending on what kind you get. Of course, not only do you have to manage the abnormalities, you also have to manage your employees. Employees have two kinds of health bar, one for their life and another for their sanity. In addition, they have four stats, fortitude, prudence, temperance, and justice. These determine their health, sanity, speed, and success rate working with abnormalities. You improve these stats by working with abnormalities using corresponding work type. You can improve stats with law points as well, but law points are kind of a scarce resource. You also need to recruit more employees, which you'll probably need to do often as the facility expands and employees die. Perhaps the most challenging part of it all are the core suppressions. They're like the boss fights of the game. How does a management sim have boss fights? Well, these suppressions have additional requirements to complete the day while also having to contend with various handicaps or having a very strong enemy you need to defeat. For example, Isad has one of the more interesting suppressions, where the HUD is obfuscated and certain stats are hidden from you. You really have to rely on your memory on where each abnormality is and what you need to do with them. The last few days of the game are particularly brutal. The game throws all the cheap tricks it has at you and it's a real test of the skills you've learned up to that point. To sum the gameplay up. There's a lot you have to remember and pay attention to. Personally, i found that maybe management isn't for me. The gameplay isn't bad or anything. In fact, I know many people that absolutely love it, but didn't appeal to me much. It truly was the SCP game about CBT. I found all the abnormalities and employees you had to pay attention to overwhelming, and the constant need to restart the day because of a minor mishap could be frustrating. However, I found the difficulty of the game to be interesting because it's actually a core part of the narrative and the themes of the game. In a way, the game is about overcoming failure, all the characters undergo personal failings. It's about doing things over and over again to try and get the right result. The facility itself is a place full of despair and you really do feel the hopelessness of the characters at times. The way the gameplay and narrative are interwoven is nothing short of masterful. In addition, overcoming these difficult trials offers a sense of reward that you don't get from easier games. There's also something to be said about how the gameplay loop makes one numb to the value of life. What I mean is that initially, I went in trying to ensure all my cute little employees survived the day, resetting when one died. As the game went on and the days grew longer, mishaps piled up and constant resets got annoying. It got to the point where I would accept progress at the cost of my employees' lives. I started to see them as more as expendable tools, even purposefully sacrificing them for the sake of progress. After all, they can always be replaced. To talk more about the things I actually enjoyed about the gameplay, there's a certain thrill to discovering all these abnormalities. Even with the more difficult ones, I was curious to unlock more information about them. They have some really cool designs, some of my favorites being Red Riding Hood and Mercenary, and Dura Freischutz. They're so cool looking. I love all the magical girls, even a Queen of Hatred is a real pain to deal with. All the abnormalities have their own little stories you get about them that shed light on their backstory, or provide employees' perspective on them. Reading about this was always fun and interesting. There is good variety in the designs for abnormalities. You have some that are Lovecrafty and horrors beyond comprehension, but others that are just a dog or a little creature that makes you bald. What really kept me going despite the hardships in the game is the narrative. I don't think that management sims are usually praised for their stories, so this might surprise some people as it did me. Each day you get snippets of narrative development. Early on it's normal conversations with your trusty secretary Angela, but things get stranger as you learn more about the history of Lobotomy Corporation and how it was founded. The writing here is exceptional, as is the way it builds up these mysteries about what abnormalities really are, or the truth behind everything that's happening in the game. It's impressive how fairly innocuous statements made early in the game have much more meaning with more context about the characters. Masterful foreshadowing. Where Lobotomy Corporation truly excels is in its character writing. It's actually a deeply personal and emotional story. It's a cast of extremely flawed yet likable characters. 
Angela is the first person you meet in Constant Confidant. He's an AI specifically designed to assist you in managing the facility. He's like the mascot, but is a difficult character to talk about without spoiling anything. Here, she's portrayed as very callous and manipulative. I'll talk more about her character and why she's my favorite in Project Moon when I talk about Ruina. Aside from her, you have the Sephiroth, also called the Sephiroth. Those leading the different departments of the facility. Malkuth is the leader of the control team. She's cheerful and enthusiastic about her job. Maybe a bit too enthusiastic, as it causes her self-destructive tendencies. She is desperate to prove herself, which leads to her taking on more work than she can handle and causing trouble for her as well as her team. Yusad is the leader of the information team. He's cold and enforces a strict adherence to the rules. This might make him sound like a bastard, but he's like that because he wants to avoid needless casualties. In a workplace as dangerous as LobCorp, this is sensible, but there are times where he might take it too far. Ned Satch is the leader of the safety team and one of my favorite characters in the game. He's oppressed and unmotivated. He can't handle the constant death of his subordinates and other employees. He tries to drown his sorrows in alcohol and drugs, making him seem like a good-for-nothing drunkard to most of the other Sephiroth. He wonders why he's even in the position he's in when he's clearly not cut out for it. All this causes his almost nihilistic viewpoint, saying things like, what's the point of saving an employee's life if you're just going to watch them die the next day? It all felt like a realistic representation of depression as well as showing what a cruel environment like that can do to someone. The missions you need to do for him to advance his storyline also factor into his character and team very well. They're all about avoiding deaths of employees and minimizing psychological harm. Just a fantastic character that's extremely attractive as well. Pod is the leader of the training team. On the surface, she's someone that's extremely kind and caring towards her subordinates. In actuality, while she does care for them somewhat, she does it all in a vain attempt to look like a good person. Ultimately, it's all about her self-validation and not an earnest attempt to help those around her. Typhoreth is the leader of the central command team. They're interesting because they're actually two children, a pair of twins who apparently have the same name. One is a boy and the other is a girl. They have almost parallel opposite personalities. Girl Typhoreth is immature and kind of bratty, with the way she talks down to other Sephira. The boy on the other hand is more easygoing and has more sense than his sister in many ways. Giver is the leader of the disciplinary team. She's so cool and absolutely ruthless in her job of dealing with abnormalities. Her anger towards abnormalities can get in the way of her rational judgment, and she'll prioritize suppressing them no matter the cost to the lives of her employees. Kesset is the leader of the welfare team. He's similar to Ned Satch, but instead of always being drunk, he's always drinking coffee. He's very laid back and cynical. He's given up on trying to do his best at his job due to constant failures. He's become complacent in his role as an overseer of death. Hakma is the leader of the Wrecker team. He's one of the few characters that understands what's truly going on. Vina is the leader of the Extraction team. She's an enigma that speaks in riddles. Vina and Hakma are both phenomenal and fascinating characters in their own right, but they're hard to talk about because you don't meet them until late in the game. They save the most interesting characters for last. In short, we have a bunch of people with severe personality flaws running a facility full of monsters. I'm sure nothing could go wrong. It's incredible how much characterization is put into the handful of scenes each character gets. First impressions serve as climaxes to each character's arc. As difficult as they may be to overcome, it feels rewarding because the growth it causes for the characters afterwards and the additional bit of insight you get into their character. Akuma might be my favorite narratively, despite the absolute torment that suppression can be. But one small disappointment is that I wish there was more scenes of the Sephiroth interacting with each other. Most of the time, they're one-on-one -on -one talks with the player, with only a couple instances with them talking to each other during these scenes. I think it would be interesting to see the relationships between the Sephiroth flushed out a bit more. If you've been paying attention and know anything about Jewish mysticism, you may have noticed something odd. You see, all the characters and many other things are named after concepts in the Kabbalah. In particular, it takes a lot from the Tree of Life. The whole facility is actually an inverted Tree of Life, with Malkith on the top instead of the bottom. The three layers of the facility, Asaya, Uriah, and Atsulith, are named after three of the four worlds of the Tree of Life. Only missing Yetzirah for some reason. The Sephiroth all get their names from the Sephiroth, attributes of the Kabbalah. These names aren't just chosen randomly either. The attribute relates to the character in some way, some better than others. For example, Ned Satcher's name can mean victory or endurance, among other things. I feel like this relates to the way Ned Satch is able to survive in spite of his depression and the circumstances around him. This whole character is about continuing to live, no matter what hardships life throws at you. Overall, he's one of the most tenacious characters in the cast, hence his name being synonymous with endurance. 
Another important Kabbalah concept that's referenced is the Kwaifoth. Represented by Kwaifoth meltdowns, the mechanic that causes abnormalities to breach, Kwaifoth are like evil spirits that are opposite to the Sephiroth. In the game, Kwaifoth can be interpreted as the sins of the facility. All in all, I think there is a good deal of thought and research put into all these references. It's a core part of the narrative and themes of the game. It's not the first game to use such concepts, of course others like Shin Megami Tensei and even DSRI have used the Kabbalah as a basis for their concepts, but LobCorp has its own unique spin on it. It may be interesting enough to do a bit of additional research, however I'm no expert so if anything I said is wrong feel free to correct me. The Bottomate Corporation is a thematically rich game with a lot that can be interpreted. Most obvious is its strong anti-capitalist message. I mean the game is literally about providing energy for the rest of the world even as the corpses of your employees pile up. It's just a slightly exaggerated version of how real corporations exploit the working class as much as they can get away with. The Bottomate Corporation cranks this up to 11 and the best part is it's all ingrained into the gameplay. As I've mentioned before, you are incentivized and trained by the game to use your employees as expendable meat shields. You could even go as far as to say the tedious tasks the game makes you do fit with a dull 9 to 5 job. I feel like a natural question someone would ask is why anyone would work at Lob Corp in the first place. While the game itself doesn't directly answer this question, I think it's obvious. People need money to live and Lob Corp hopefully at least pays decently. They're just wage slaves. The game goes out of its way to point out how much competition there is to get into a lobotomy corporation, which makes normal employees so easily replaceable. Honestly, it's only slightly worse than working a normal retail job. Either way, you're going into the meat grinder. Aside from the scathing social commentary, it features themes about the potential for people to improve and overcome their flaws, despite the cynical nature of the Senate. The messages of the games are pretty optimistic. For example, the game's resets might sound annoying, but it carries heavy thematic weight. Aside from doing things over again, it carries the idea of doing it better next time, to advance further, to gain a better position and understanding of the world. It's an optimistic message amidst the pain. As dark as the story may get, it shows that there's hope to be found, as long as you keep striving towards it. In terms of presentation, I feel like Lobotomy Corporation is very unique. The simplistic, almost chibi-like art style makes it stand out. I feel like this may repel some, but I've grown to quite like it. It causes some comedy due to the dissonance between the cute looking employee characters and the horrific violence that can be inflicted on them. This design choice is justified well in the story as well. It's revealed fairly early on that the player is viewing the facility through the lens of a cognition filter. This is the reason the characters look so simple and why abnormalities might not be as scary as you'd expect. It's to prevent you from seeing the true horrors of the facility and avoid any psychological scarring it could cause. This also fits with the cynical capitalist commentary. Painting over the world with pretty pictures to avoid confronting the harsh realities of the world is very similar to how corporations sell products. It's in tune with the poisons inherent in living in a city, as shown in Project Moon games. This attention to detail and seamless intertwining between narrative and art is something I adore. Furthermore, the music is equal parts mesmerizing and haunting. There are some absolute banger songs, but these are usually only played during the most stressful situations, like Second Warning. You know when you hear it that things are not going well. As great as the music is, it's not something I listen to in my free time. That's for one simple reason, it stresses me out too much to hear that music again, even after finishing the game. The memories of all the days gone wrong still linger. Wrapping all this talk of Lobotomy Corporation up, it's a painful yet enthralling game. I feel like it's one of the strongest cases I've seen of a story that uses the medium of a video game to the fullest to tell an impactful story that can't be done in any other medium. As much as I joke about how much suffering the gameplay cost, it wouldn't be nearly as effective without it. You just can't get the same experience or appreciation for the story by looking up the cutscenes or reading a summary. This is a game I implore people to try for themselves, even if you've never played a management sim before. You may be surprised to find yourself enjoying the game. I know people who genuinely had fun with the gameplay and sent countless hours into it. You won't know how you feel about it until you try. You need to face the fear in order to build the future, and this series has quite the future ahead of it. Project Moon's next game was Library of Ruin, which was released in 2021. It's a major departure from its predecessor in many ways, sporting a new art style, completely different gameplay, and a larger budget. These changes are made evident as soon as you boot up the game. You greet with an opening cinematic foreshadowing events to come with an original vocal song, String Theocracy by Melly in the background. As soon as I saw it, I was entranced. I knew this was going to be a special experience. 
It's a direct sequel to Lobotomy Corporation, exploring the ramifications the events of that game had on the rest of the world. Angela is the main protagonist, along with Roland, a new character. They're joined by returning Sephiroth from Obcorp, who are now patron librarians, each with a corresponding floor of the library. Malketh is the patron librarian of the floor of history, Yusaw is the patron librarian of the floor of technological sciences, so on and so forth. They are part of a library that turns guests they battle into books. The story follows them as their library rises in notoriety throughout the city, battling progressively stronger factions. We see more of the world of Project Moon, while exploring the effects its rules have on the human psyche and condition. The gameplay this time revolves around deck building. I've been told it's similar to something like Slay the Spire, but I've never played that. Personally, it reminded me a bit of my time playing stuff like Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering when I was younger. Of course, this isn't nearly as complex as those games, but it's the closest comparison I have. Essentially, you choose what floor of the library you want to use. Each floor has teams of up to five librarians. Every character has a freely customizable deck of nine cards. The only restriction being that you can only have a maximum of three of the same card. Each card has a certain cost to use it. Usually the stronger cards cost more to use, less costly cards don't deal as much damage, but might have other useful effects. Ideally, you have a balance of low cost cards with one or two powerful ones. Light is the resource you need to use the cards. It's something you'll need to keep a close eye on and manage. Each character has their own light god. You have to balance using cards while trying not to run low on light. You also want to be careful not to use too many cards on the same turn, or else you'll run out of cards and will be stuck with the one card to use on your next turn. This is why having cards with effects that let you draw more cards or gain light are absolutely essential. Another important resource to keep in mind is the emotion level. You gain positive or negative emotion points as you win or lose clashes in battle. Each time the emotion level rises to a new level, your team will have their light restored, maximum light can increase, and you will gain access to abnormality pages. Enemies also have an emotion gauge and get the same effects you do, so you should take note of their level as well. At the start of battle, each character rolls the speed dice they have, which determines the attack order. Enemies also have their own speed dice and you can see what characters of yours they're targeting. What's interesting about this is you can intercept enemies of lower speed. This can be useful in cases where one of your librarians is being targeted by an enemy they don't have a card that could win that clash. You can send a librarian that rolled a higher speed and has better cards than the enemy to attack them first, so your first ally doesn't get harmed. Your cards have ranges on how much damage they can deal, depending on the dice roll. When your character goes against an opposing character's card, that's a clash. You roll your dice against your opponents and whoever is higher wins. This can also depend on how many actions a card has. Many have more than one. So if your card has two actions and your opponent has three, you might win two of the clashes, but you might not have any defense against the third attack. Furthermore, cards aren't just purely offensive, some have guard or evade actions. Characters not only have a health bar, but a stagger bar. Having a stagger bite depleted will make a character completely vulnerable for a turn, unable to act and fatal to all damage types. Focusing on depleting the stagger bar first and doing massive damage when they're vulnerable is usually the best strategy. There are three attack types, pierce, blunt, and slash. Paying attention to what types the enemies are weak to and which ones they resist is key to victory in the early game. Your character might also have weaknesses towards a particular damage type, so be attentive and try not to let a character clash against a character who is using that damage type. Aside from normal combat cards, you also have key pages. These are like a character's equipment, they affect a character's stats and grant passive buffs. The best ones are unique, so you can only equip them to one library. The passive buffs included in the key pages can be transferred to other key pages, at the cost of the page of the buff that's being transferred can't be equipped. Transferring buffs like this becomes integral to giving you the extra edge you need towards the end game. Okay, so that was a brief overview of the gameplay. It may sound overwhelming at first, but you quickly get used to it after a few battles. Personally, I love it. It's strategic and messing with different deck builds was fun. I always look forward to seeing what new cards I'd get after battle and how I'd make use of them. The freedom of customizing your decks to create strategy is probably the best part of the game. With enough creativity, you can make some powerful decks. Seeing how other people approach deck building and seeing how they can defeat bosses as quickly as possible was interesting. You can even do self-imposed challenges like solo runs if you really want to. There's a degree of luck involved in the rolls for your attacks and speed dice. I think that's part of what makes battles interesting. You can get into bad situations because of bad luck, but so can your enemies. I think it's important that battles aren't completely predictable, and it does feel really good when things go your way. Another thing I love is how status effects are actually pretty useful. I think a common trapping of RPGs is, to me is having some status effects that aren't very useful because the bosses are immune to them. 
Here you can use status effects against basically any enemy, including bosses. It gets crazy towards the end game just how much lead or burn you can stack on an enemy if you have the right setup. Smoke is a fun status effect to use because it makes your enemies take more damage, while you deal even more damage. The game plays it perfect however, there are a few small gripes I have with it, like the way you get more cards. Enemies drop books when you defeat them in battle. You can burn these books to obtain cards and key pages from a pool of them. Which ones you get are random in a gotcha-like system. This might not be so bad if books weren't the same resource you need to do battles and progress the story. This means you may have to grind for more books if you want to get all the cards in a set. It's a bit annoying and feels like it's designed that way to get people to grind and spend more time with the game. This might have made more sense when it was in early access and they needed some content to keep people busy between releasing more story content, but in the full game it felt unnecessary. I also feel that a couple fights are designed in an annoying way, like the sweepers who constantly heal themselves. Battles against them isn't that hard, but it felt like it dragged on because of their abilities. Battles later into the game can take a while in general, which can get a bit exhausting. After hearing about how difficult Lobotomy Corporation was, you may wonder how this shapes up. The answer is that it's difficult yet fair. There's a bit of trial and error involved much like Lobcorp. Initially you won't know the fight's gimmick, but if you do lose, you should understand what to do and how to build decks around the fight. Even if you do get stumped, beating at least one enemy in a fight will get you a book and therefore access to some of the same cards they have, which could even the playing field a bit. Perhaps you've heard that the difficulty spike is vertical, there's some truth to that. The game starts pretty easily, all you need to do to win is exploit enemy weaknesses around urban plague. The difficulty suddenly amps up. Typically, people mean the Queen of Hatred fight when they say this, which is a huge step up in difficulty from previous abnormality battles. This is due to this fight's gimmick that punishes you for doing too well, and it is the first fight you encounter to use mass attacks. It is tough when you first unlock this fight, however, you don't need to do abnormality battles to progress the story. You can always come back later with more powerful cards to challenge this fight. There's also a pretty easy exploit for this fight if you can figure it out. There are some other sudden difficulty spikes like this, such as the beginning of the Star of the City, the second to last chapter. All the fights you have at the beginning of this chapter can be kinda brutal, as the enemies seem to have better cards than you do. Once you're able to overcome at least one of the intro fights, then you'll find out this is actually the most fun chapter. This is when you get the really crazy strong cards that make battles more fun. View association decks are so cool. Of course, there's Will of the City, a card you want in basically all of your decks because of how good it is for light regeneration, and that allows you to draw a card. Not to mention all the awesome key pages with unique passives. It's at this point you can almost trivialize parts of the game. In particular, using Gebra and her unique key page almost felt like cheating with how ridiculously strong she is. If you could almost solo encounters, the poor guests stand no chance against her. Still, abnormality fights and realizations can pose a challenge when you can't use Gebra against them. Overall, I'd say that Ruina is sufficiently challenging when not being overly punishing like Lobcorp could feel at times. The majority of fights will be against human guests, but abnormalities make a return in special boss battles. Each floor of the library has unique abnormality fights that you need to do to expand that forest team limit and unlock abnormality pages. These battles themselves are actually the hardest content in the game, or at least I had more trouble with them than most of the story boss battles. Abnormality battles are gimmicky and kind of try to emulate the mechanics they had in Lobcorp into this gameplay. A lot of these gimmicks are annoying. For example, Scarecrow searching for wisdom, the first abnormality for Chessid's floor. The central gimmick revolves around getting a specific card by blocking or dodging their attacks, then using that card you gain to counter one of their attacks. This can be annoying because sometimes they won't use the attack you're supposed to guard against, so you can't get the card you need to counter their big attack. In addition, they can steal the cards of your librarians and at this point only have 3 librarians to work with. It was an annoying fight for me that took many tries to get right. There are some with mechanics that are actually kind of fun and interesting. One of the ones that stood out to me is Hakuma's battle against the Price of Silence. That one has a timer during the combat phase, so you have to set up all your attacks in 30 seconds. In addition, you take damage from pausing. This was funny and I love the way it tied back to Hawkman's suppression in Lobcorp, so I couldn't get mad at these mechanics. I say that overall, abnormality battles are more like puzzles compared to normal receptions and require more planning. What I adore about abnormality battles is that they're not given to a floor randomly. They relate thematically or narratively to the patron librarian of that floor. For instance, Malkuth's first abnormality battle is against Scorch Girl, an abnormality that takes the form of a girl that was burned to death because of her desire for affection. This is obviously symbolic of Malkuth's own desires to prove herself to others, causing her self-destructive tendencies. Odd has today's shy look to represent her own multi-faced personality, and hypocrisy is another great example. 
There was certainly a lot of thought put into what abnormalities would match each character. There was connections that could be interpreted in Lob Corp, but here it makes it blatant. After you've completed all the floor's abnormality battles, you unlock that floor's realization. This is a five-stage boss rush against every previous abnormality battle, plus a new one. This might sound scary, but it isn't actually too bad. Now that you have a full team and all the abnormality pages, the earlier abnormalities are usually pretty easy. Your party also gets healed slightly between phases. A few of them took me a while, like Hodge Realization, but most of them were manageable and only took a few tries. Winning these abnormality fights will grant you access to more of the floor's abnormality pages. Abnormality pages are passive abilities that you can choose between when your motion level rises in battle. These abilities give each floor their own unique playstyle and incentives to try out other floors. You might gravitate to one if the abnormality pages match your playstyle. For example, in the early game, I used Ned Satch's floor the most. His abnormality cards focused on survivability, pages like Lapping Powder, which replenishes the standard gauge one hit, and a token of friendship, which heals the team's HP for three turns. It's a useful floor for dealing with longer battles, and it helped me get used to the mechanics of the game. I feel like this defensive playstyle is very well suited for Ned Satch's character. The main theme for him is the fearlessness to continue living, so of course he has utility to keep his team alive and minimize damage. My favorite floor to use was Gebra's. It's mostly due to Gebra herself, but her abnormality pages help her do big damage. I guess it is the last one I'll talk about because I thought it was interesting. Despite not using this floor much, it's all about the theme of friendship. Gaining buffs for protecting allies or gaining strength equal to the number of allies you have. This floor has cool stuff. He sadly kind of gets overshadowed by the other powerhouse floors you get at the time. Let's finally discuss the story. It starts almost immediately where the true ending of Lobotomy Corporation left off. Angela creates a library out of what once was the facility. He aims to find what she believes to be the one perfect book, something that will answer all the questions she has and grant her freedom. This time she is joined by Roland, a washed up ninth grade fixer that somehow finds himself in the library and becomes Angela's servant. This is after she tears some of his limbs off and gives him a new body, though not like he has much of a choice. Together, they receive guests and turn them into books. Basically, in order to get this perfect book, Angela needs to gather power by turning people into books. To do this, invitations are sent out, and they always seem to find their way to ones who would most benefit from going to the library. The invitations come with a deal. Go to the library and overcome a trial. If they win, they get the books they need. But if they lose, they'll turn into a book themselves. Angela believes this system to be fair, but that's questionable. Ruina is a more ambitious story than Lobcorp, aiming to deliver more world building and introduce tons of new characters and concepts. In Lobotomy Corporation, the whole game was set in the facility, and while you are occasionally given hints as to what the world on the outside is like, here you actually see it. When you start a reception, you are given a brief glimpse into the situation that led to the guests who are going to the library, which sheds light on those characters as well as how people live on the outside. You kind of placed in the same situation as Angela. He spent her whole life in Lobotomy Corporation, and any knowledge she does have about the rest of the world is surface level, only pertaining to what she would need to know to do her job. She may know what fixers are, but she doesn't know about the different fixer agencies or how they operate. That's why Roland is here. He spent his life surviving in the city, and he knows it well. He can explain these concepts and give his perspective. Now, to talk about the fascinating setting of these games, a dystopian megacity known simply as The City. It's home to technological marvels and horrors beyond comprehension. If I had to describe it, I'd say it's like cyberpunk bloodborne. There's this mix of futuristic technology like cybernetic implants and AI, but behind that, there's some cosmic horror involved. A big bloodborne element here is how everyone uses medieval weaponry like swords despite all this technology. There's even a guy who dresses like a bloodborne hunter. There's actually an explanation for this that boils down to bullets being ridiculously expensive. The most cyberpunk element of all is how every corporation is evil, sacrificing human dignity in service of capital gain. In spite of technological marvels, quality of life for an average person is abysmal. The head is the main authority of the city. They make and enforce the rules. They're a mysterious entity. Nobody knows anything about them, only that they're the head of A Corp and you do not want to get on their bad side. The city is made up of 26 districts, each headed by a corporation called a wing. Each wing has this piece of incredible technology that they base their business around. The Bottomy Corporation was one such wing, and if you thought it was messed up, there are 25 more corporations that profiteer off of human suffering, all of them with their own unique scientific or cosmic horror. Runa goes about exploring some of these other corporations and their singularities. For example, W Corp and their warp trains. They have a train system that can get to any district in the city in only 10 seconds. 
Sounds convenient, doesn't it? Maybe a bit too convenient. Everything has its price. I won't reveal how these trains function, but they are one of the most horrific things in the game. The scene demonstrating the effects it has is one of the most harrowing in the entire game. What's cool about all this is that while Ruiner reveals the secrets of a few of these wings, there's still a plethora of them we know nothing about, leaving plenty of room to explore them in later games. Aside from the wings, you also get more information about fixer associations, which are like mercenaries. They fix problems for money, and they all operate in different ways. There's these syndicates as well, the organized crime rings that run the back streets, which are the almost lawless slums where the poor people who aren't fortunate enough to live in a nest live. Getting to the characters now, we have all the separate from Lob Corp returning. Now it's patron librarians. We'll awaken them one by one as the story progresses. The brilliant thing about this is that the development they received in Lob Corp is reflecting their characters as they further develop in this game. For example, you saw it doesn't wear gloves, which is incredible considering he had a major phobia of revealing skin. All the conversations with them show how they've grown, while providing more insight to how their lives were before joining Lobotomy Corporation. Ned Satch is still one of my favorites. Love this guy. Glad he's less depressed here and drinks alcohol because he likes it and not simply because he doesn't want to think about all the death around him. What I like about him here is how he has this sincere respect for life, even for his opponents. Probably my favorite cutscene with him is when he talks about how people who claim to want to die are lying. It's people like they want to live the most. It's a discussion that resonated with me and it's interesting how he's probably talking about how he was when he was with Lobcorp. Akuma really stood out to me here too. He has many speeches about faith, which makes sense because he's on the floor of religion. What's interesting is that he doesn't talk about faith in a purely religious sense. He talks about the necessity for a strong belief or conviction in something in order to move forward. Even misguided faith can have a purpose if you truly believe in it. For Angela, this faith is the one perfect book that she's after, which Shakuma himself is critical of. I love Takuma's character in Lob Corp, and here they added even more to his character. Bina is as incredibly cool as always. He's here to wax poetic and challenge Roland's worldview. Art is making strides and becoming more of the good person she always wanted to be. Kessid is great in this game. He has fun interactions with Roland. One thing I loved was they actually had small events of the librarians hanging out. There's only a handful of these scenes, but they were fun and much appreciated. I never knew I needed a conversation between Nitsatch and Hakma until I saw it. Aside from the main cast, there's also all the guests you meet. The game does a good job of making most of these characters likable and memorable, despite the brief time they're in the story. You get an understanding of why they need to go to the library and can often sympathize with them. I felt bad for killing a majority of them, but anything for Angela. You get additional bits of characterization for them in their battle dialogue. You see the reactions characters have when their comrades die in battle and it can be depressing. Some guests are set up before you fight them by appearing in previous story sections. These are usually the better characters because they get more time to develop. Like Philip, where you witness his constant downward spiral throughout the story. Gao is one of my favorites because she has such incredible development in a short amount of time. Plus the battle against her is amazing. In addition to the scenes you get before receptions, key pages can provide additional world building or characterization about the character they're based on. They can go into more detail about the organization a character belongs to, or talk more about their life before going to the library. I think these tidbits you get in addition to their scenes can make even more morally questionable characters oddly endearing. An example being Pierre and Jack a couple of cannibalistic chefs that come to the library in search of fresh ingredients. They may be turned off by the whole cannibalism thing, but they still have their own ambitions, and they seem to genuinely care for each other. Pierre is cute, so she should be forgiven for her crimes anyway. Of course, the real stars of the game are Angela and Roland. Those two are the main heart of the story. Much of the game is spent on their introspection and development. In spite of the grander scope of the story, it still manages to tell a very emotional and personal story, centered around these two. In Lobotomy Corporation, Angela was cool and mysterious, but she didn't exactly develop. Unlike all these Sephira who had their suppressions to deal with their personal traumas, she was neglected. This may be directly responsible for her actions in this game. For all that she has suffered, all she wants is freedom and agency. She rejects her programming and what she's supposed to do. She wants to be allowed to be herself. The opening song, String Theocracy, is all about her and her desire for freedom. The lyrics follow someone that's forced to play a role. The song is from Angela's perspective as she's forced through the events of Lob Corp, guided by the strings of the scripture, while showing a longing for a freedom from it all. A theocracy is a system of government centered on religion, so a string theocracy is like being forcibly guided by strings that are like God. Again, very on the nose with how Angela is like a marionette on a string, a machine built to serve a specific purpose and never deviate from that purpose. Her more rebellious nature in this game is also reflected in her design. 
She has short her hair to separate herself from the events of Love Corp, so as to distance herself from the one she was based on. She's trying to assert her own identity. The look here is reminiscent of Rei A and Ami from Neon Genesis Evangelion, no doubt a major influence on her character. They're both created for someone else's ambitions and as a replacement for someone else. They're both seemingly emotionless, but internally resent the roles they've been given. The parallels are obvious, it's no coincidence I love them both immensely. Runa walks a delicate balance of making her sympathetic and understandable, while also making her actions very questionable. You can see the reason why she's made the choices she has and how she longs for freedom, but at the same time, is it really worth all the people you have to kill to achieve it? She believes her methods are more fair than those of Lobotomy Corporation because they have the freedom to choose to go to the library, but do they really? The game goes to great lengths to show that people are driven to go to the library by circumstances or necessity. Many are just trying to do their jobs or venture comrades that died in the library. The first ones to be lured into the library are essentially a couple of homeless people who are trying to improve their lot in life. Do they really have a choice besides starve or continue being homeless? The fixers need to make ends meet as well, they can't afford to turn down a job, even if it costs them their life. Maybe Angela isn't the only one being guided by strings. Ironically, Angela's library becomes a part of the cycle of suffering and violence that perpetuates the city. Angela's indifference towards the lives of others being lost can make her seem cold-hearted, but you have to remember she's an AI that spent her whole life in the Lobotomy Corporation. Her sense of morality is like that of a child. She doesn't understand the weight of her actions or understand the suffering people in the city endure because of her own warped environment. The realizations show how much Lobotomy Corporation traumatized her, as it shows how life was like there from her perspective. Despite her longing for freedom, she is chained to her past, which is a common problem many characters in the series have. Overall, I think she's a cool and nuanced character. She's easily become a favorite of mine in general, and not purely because of the Rei Ayanami similarities. She's a strong-willed woman. She has suffered so much and yet has refused to break down. I like seeing how she gradually changed throughout the story because of her relationship with Roland and the others. Her arc really resonates with me. Always did have a thing for marrying nuts to cut their own strings. To me, she's the real star of the city. Roland, on the other hand, is interesting in a different way. You didn't actually think much of him at first, but he became far more fascinating when you learn more about his backstory. On the surface, he's a relaxed and sarcastic guy, but deep down he's extremely jaded. The city and its endless cruelty have worn him down. He's aware of the city's cycle of violence and suffering, yet it is part of it which he hates himself for. He doesn't believe there's any way to improve the city, and that any attempts to do so would be in vain, so he passively accepts the status quo. He doesn't hold any expectations for life because what's the point when everything can be taken from you in a moment's notice? He has this catchphrase, that's that and this is this. It's an amusing line and shows his cynical nature. It's a way to detach himself from another person's tragedies and be complacent. Basically, a person's sufferings that brought them to the library don't matter to him. He only knows he needs to kill them in a present moment. He's a very well-rounded and likable character, in spite of all of his flaws. Seeing his development is as interesting to Paul as Angela's. There are good reasons why he's so popular and beloved. The themes double down on the anti-capitalist message of Lobotomy Corporation. Every corporation is presented as unambiguously bad and only interested in profit. Almost every problem in the city is caused by unchecked hypercapitalism. It shows how the people at the top profit, while the marginalized and poor are forced to fight over scraps. There are certainly parallels that could be made to reality, except that corporations in real life are run by even worse idiots. Another major theme is the search for meaning in life in a world so bleak. It's something many characters in the story struggle with. People in the city are so concerned with surviving the day to day, that having passions or dreams to follow is extremely uncommon. Even the middle class living in the nests live unfulfilling lives being wage slaves for corporations. Philosophically speaking, I think that Runa and Project Moon games in general lean towards existentialism. Even in a world that some would say has no meaning, people can still find their own subjective meaning in living. You can see this through multiple characters who start questioning the meaning of their lives, like Angela. They either have to affirm their own meaning for life or fall into the pit of nihilism. This is explored through the Index, one of the biggest syndicates in the city. It consists of people who strictly follow the prescripts, seemingly random tasks given to them by a mysterious source. They follow these prescripts like your religion. No matter how cruel or absurd these tasks are, they follow them without hesitation, and punish those who fail to follow their prescript. A question one would ask is why anyone would willingly join such an organization. The implied answer is that the prescripts give people a sense that their actions have meaning that they're part of something larger than themselves. By surrendering free will to their prescripts, they are given direction, 
Lastly, a big theme of the game is the idea that everyone has their own story and perspective. This is why people are turned into books and why you see events through the lens of the guests before you fight them. Going to the presentation, the art style is noticeably a lot different from Lobotomy Corporation. This is because of the lack of cognition filter. You're seeing the world for what it is. I really like the art, it's anime-like, but still very distinct. There's a plethora of really cool CGs. Another noticeable difference is the inclusion of voice acting. I quite like the performance of Angela's voice actress. The music has some remixed tracks from Love Corp, while having plenty of original songs of its own. Each floor has their own battle theme, which can change depending on the situation. When things get bad, it'll change to a remix of the warning music from Love Corp. But as you're doing well, the floor theme will become more triumphant. It's cool how dynamic the music is. The song that plays during realizations is amazing. I love how the song amps up as you progress through the phases of the battle. The most well-known ruin of music are the Millie insert songs. Project Millie is an indie music group that has done music for anime like Goblin Slayer and tons of their own original work. Their work in Ruin is exceptional. Their insert songs play during certain boss battles, and what's really cool is how the lyrics match the narrative and the characters you're fighting. They're good songs on their own, but the context of the game gives them additional meaning. My favorite have to be Iron Lotus. It's such a banger, and the battle it plays in is one of the best. Children of the City and Poems of a Machine are top tier as well. I still regularly listen to these songs. They're stuck in my head. After all my praise, I think some might ask if you can play this game without playing Lobotomy Corporation. The answer is a bit complicated. Roland doesn't know what happened in that game, so you do get characters explaining the events of that game. However, you probably won't be able to properly appreciate just how far the characters have come since Lob Corp unless you've played it. You won't have that same attachment. It is understandable that people might want to skip to this game because it is the more approachable of the two, as it has arguably better gameplay. I still recommend people at least give Love Corp a shot first. You might end up enjoying it more than you think. I wrote a lot about Ruina, more than I was expecting. This is indicative of my passion for the game. Ruina has become one of my favorite games after playing it. There's a lot to love about it. The combat, the characters, the music. It all made for an unforgettable experience. It's a game that solidified my love for Project Moon. They now occupy a similar space in my brain as Alisoft. I can't recommend it enough. Project Moon has made games, but they've also released webcomics that expand on the world and lore. First is Lobotomy Corporation Wonder Lab, a spin-off written and illustrated by Mimi. It ran from February 17th, 2020 to April 9th, 2021. The story occurs around the same time as Lobotomy Corporation, present with the branch facilities. Lob Corp was set in the main headquarters and with them being the biggest energy provider in the city, of course they have many different branches in different districts. A Lob Corp had a manager's perspective. Here you view the world through three normal employees as they try to survive the day-to-day -day hell and wage slave lifestyle. The story is structured around arcs dealing with different abnormalities. All of these are new and it introduces aberrations, which are like weird offshoots of already existing abnormalities. This may sound a bit standard, but Wonder Lab is anything but. I'd actually describe it as a weird combination of revolutionary girl Utena and Madoka Magica. It can be weird, dark, and extremely gay. The three protagonists are pretty good characters, the real standout here being Cat. He's the captain of the disciplinary team, and appears very aloof and uncaring on the surface. As the story goes on, it becomes obvious that this is just a defense mechanism to survive in Lob Corp. In a work environment where people constantly die, she tries to distance herself from others to avoid becoming attached to them. This is when Ty and Rose join the disciplinary team, as she begrudgingly starts to form a friendship with the two, and you get to see more of her cute side. While Kat is the experienced Lob Corp veteran, Rose and Ty are basically greenhorns and the story is about them adapting to their environment. Watching their development is interesting because they step up to the challenge of facing abnormalities. They do their best to retain their idealism. They want to save their co-workers and improve things, even if that impact is small. Ty is the one that feels like they grew the most overall, starting off as a mere clerk, eventually becoming strong-willed and able to hold their own against abnormalities. Rose is cool too, I like how they explore their backstory and how they feel about wings like Lob Corp. The friendship between the three of these characters is the heart of the story. They kind of form a lesbian polycule. On the topic of gender, what's neat here is that none of the characters technically have defined genders. The characters are always referred to by name or with they them pronouns. This was done deliberately as Mimi has said that they want people to appreciate their characters for the writing, not purely because of their gender identity. Mimi even actively encourages readers to think what they want about a character's gender. I think this decision is interesting and true to the actual game, as the employees in Lob Corp are also androgynous, so you can make them whatever you want. 
This made even more sense when I learned that Mimi is apparently genderqueer, which explains all the gay subtext. The new abnormalities are cool. I think it kind of captures the feeling of getting a new abnormality and not knowing exactly what they're capable of that you'd get in the game. A few, like Servant of Wrath, even included in Ruin. I really liked how they made game concepts like the employee stats a real thing in the story that matters. People will talk about stuff like their justice or fortitude level, which they know through periodic examinations, that affect what kind of abnormalities they can work with. They actually show how different kinds of work with abnormalities would look like. They do a good job of making interesting interactions with abnormalities, some of which prey on the character's insecurities and play up the psychological elements. Tone-wise, I think the narrative strikes a good balance between the kind of horror the series is known for, with a bit of whimsy and dark humor. There's visual gags and jokes that made me laugh, while the story kept me in suspense of wondering how far the characters would last when death is so common. The art is bright and colorful, in contrast to the dark subject matter. I think this contrast is very amusing and gives it its own distinct identity. The action scenes when the abnormalities start breaching are cool and I could mentally hear the warning music from Lobcorp in my head during them. Overall, Wonderlap is a wonderful story. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. The last arc in particular is phenomenal. It's a perfectly bittersweet finale. I can't recommend it enough, but you certainly need to play Lobotomy Corporation first to truly appreciate it. It's only 55 chapters long, short enough to read in an evening. You can read it all for free and in English on posttype.com, which is the same website that all the expanded Project Moon media I'm about to talk about are on. Leviathan is the next Project Moon webcomic, though I'm not as favorable towards it. It unfortunately had a rough development. The artist, Mongeo, had some health issues, which caused some delays and eventually they had to withdraw from the project completely after the 11th chapter. After that, the story was reworked into a web novel, with some illustrations done by Project Moon's art team. To make matters even more unfortunate, the localization team had to stop working on it after chapter 15. This was due to them shifting focus to work on the upcoming Limbus Company. The remaining 5 chapters have still not been translated, and with Limbus Company keeping the team's hands full, it's unknown if they'll ever properly get translated. It's a bunch of sad situations that led to the end result being a bit messy. The story itself follows Virgilius, a colored fixer known as the Red Gaze, in his attempts to rescue an orphan child he used to look out for, known as Lapis. A side objective he has is figuring out how his singularity works, so he can profit off of it. It's an alright story on its own, but it didn't manage to keep me as engaged as Wonderland. Virgilius himself is a pretty cool character. He has an intimidating appearance, but is a compassionate softy deep down. The rest of the cast aren't very memorable, however, with the exception of Garnet, another orphan Virgilius used to look out for, and became a fixer because he was inspired by him. He's a bit naive, but he has his moments. I think the art for the comic chapters was pretty good. It looked more like a manga compared to Wonderlab's colorful style, but it was fitting for the tone of the story. Honestly, to me, it felt like the story is mostly set up for Limbus Company, which will see the return of characters and concepts that are introduced. It does get more interesting once it switches to novel format, but it still never truly managed to grab me. It's okay, it wasn't special like Wonder Lab was. As far as other Project Moon media goes, there's also The Distortion Detective. It's a web novel written by Kim Ji Hoon himself. Initially, it was just made as an excuse for him to practice his writing, but gained a cult following. This ironically led to it being cancelled, as Ji Hoon thought it would be better for them to make an actual Distortion Detective game after they finished Limbus Company. The story follows Moses, the titular distortion detective, as he investigates cases involving the distortion phenomenon. The distortion phenomenon was a major plot element in Ruina, and this series exists to explore that concept further. Moses can see distortions before they occur, so she's the one best suited to dealing with distortion problems. The story is structured as an episodic mystery at first, but becomes focused on a bigger plot down the line. I really like Moses, she's very clever and witty. Project Moon has a thing for making cool and hot older women. Something that becomes clear as the story goes on is that she has a troubled past that has left her with some horrible trauma. The way they hint at it early on while slowly giving out more details is really interesting. Ezra is her assistant and acts as the fighter when necessary. The two have really good chemistry interactions. They are joined by Yuria, a girl that's investigating Moses' pipe and can control teddy bears. I don't want to reveal too much, I recommend reading it yourself. I enjoyed my time with it, the only problem being the abrupt way it ends. Super curious about what kind of game they'll make with these characters and ideas. This brings us to Limbus Company, Project Moon's most recent game. It's a gotcha dungeon crawl that features an entirely new cast. The mobile game thing might sound like a turn up for some, but it has caused the popularity of Project Moon to skyrocket. I've been playing it since day one and it has left me with many thoughts. 
The story centers around the 13 sinners of the Limbus Company. Our protagonist is Dante, who starts the story with amnesia and a clockhead. They're forced into being the manager of Limbus Company for reasons beyond their understanding. Despite their position of manager, Dante is given very little information about their objectives, aside from the goal of finding golden boughs which can be found in the ruins of Lobotomy Corporation facilities. He reluctantly leads the other 12 sinners, a rather unruly bunch. Fortunately, Dante has the mysterious ability to resurrect the others from death or other injury, at the cost of pain to himself. Though the story is about this gang of weirdos adventuring around the city in a bus called Mesophysiles trying to obtain these golden boughs. So far, four story parts have been released. Three have been available since launch, while the fourth part was released fairly recently. Each part focuses on a specific sinner and explores their past. So far, the writing has been pretty good. I think the second part might be the weakest, but still provided plenty of fun. The fourth part, Kanto 4, was particularly excellent, which was helped by being a lot longer than previous parts. With the story being ongoing, there's a lot to look forward to. I'm eagerly awaiting more story content and answers for the questions the story keeps raising, like about Dante's past, why we're after the Golden Boughs, and more about the Sinners. The way the story's been building up this mystery and intrigue has been interesting. Lots of room for speculation from fans. I also like how the seasonal events like Hell's Kitchen actually have narrative significance, unlike other gacha games where they happen and are never really talked about again. The characters here are what have been really filling people's brains with holes. Dante is a really interesting character. They make TikTok sounds but can communicate with other sinners telepathically. What's interesting is how they're portrayed as kind of pathetic and kind of better at their job, which is understandable with the amnesia and suddenly being thrust into this position. A lot of other characters don't take them too seriously and they're being strung around at the behest of others. They've been making bits of development as they adjust to their situation and position, so I'm curious how they'll develop further into the story. I really appreciate how Dante is an actual character and not a silent self-insert character that every other gacha has. They're terrible and boring, so this is refreshing. The sinners all get their names from classic literature, Dante from Dante's Inferno, Gregor from The Metamorphosis, Ishmael from Moby Dick, Don Quixote from Don Quixote, you get the idea. The references aren't just in their names, the entire character in the story is like a mirror of the novel they're based on, but with Project Moon's own spin on it. For example, Cromer is Sinclair's bully in the novel he's based on, and in this game she plays a similar role, but is also the leader of an insane cult. This puts intrigue on just how elements from their books will be incorporated into the story. I actually read The Stranger, the book Marceau is from. It's pretty great, I recommend it, and I wonder exactly how it'll affect this version of the character. Anyway, the sinners are all great and endearing. They're a lovable group of dysfunctional losers. Like, the first thing that happens to them in the tutorial is that they all lose and die. Luckily they have Dante around, but this sets the tone for the group. They're a group that doesn't seem to exactly like each other at first, but work together out of sharing a mutual goal. I did complain about the lack of a group dynamic in the previous Project Moon games, but here it's all about the group chemistry. It's done so well, you see them all bicker constantly, and they argue about the best way to handle certain tasks. It makes them a very endearing bunch. My favorite of the sinners is Don Quixote. She's quirky. She's quixotic, as one would think, and her ideas about justice have already gotten the team in trouble a couple times. The energy her voice actress has adds a lot to her character as well. I can't wait until we get a story chapter about her. I love Otis as well. She's a cyberfont. It's obvious that she only sucks up to Dante because he's her superior. The way she gives backhanded compliments is very funny. I need to know more about her. Her introduction hinted that she might be untrustworthy and has a utility to motives. Sinclair is a good boy trapped between two worlds. He has one of my favorite identities to use. The one who shall grip Sinclair is such a cool gimmick. Faust is one who doesn't show much emotion and is therefore made for me. I love her. Marceau is a character I didn't think too much about at first, because he seldom speaks, but I gained more understanding of him after reading his book. He's cool and I can't wait to see how they use the stranger in his story. Gregor is a bug man and is a kind of leader for the group aside from Dante. He's neat and I really like the way his backstory was explored. Heathcliff is crude and violent. I very much like his way of doing things and the way he gets into arguments constantly. Ishmael is cute and it looks like the next big story part is going to be about her, so I'm interested in seeing how it'll go. Isang is good and has the best story part so far. Ryoshu is rad. She has a very amusing quirk of constantly using weird acronyms that she never elaborates on because she doesn't want to waste words. She's perfect. Rodian has fun interactions with the rest of the cast. Ayun Liu is extremely cute. Just look at him. Pure Moe. 
What's brilliant about this cast, in comparison to other gacha games, is how it's solely focused on them. Other gacha games have casts that rotate every story part. Epileo has a different cast of servants every singularity and lost belt. Which is neat for variety, but makes it hard to get too attached to them when you know that they might not ever be important again. Here you only have these sinners, and the gameplay compensates for this by having the characters you roll for being different versions of these characters from parallel realities. I think this approach leaves more potential for character exploration and growing the bonds between characters. These sinners are joined by Virgilius from Leviathan, who takes the role of their guide. He gives the orders and berates them when they are unable to carry them out. His voice actor is excellent, he really sells Virgilius as a rugged and tired man. Very hot voice. There's Sharon, a young eccentric girl and driver of the bus. In contrast to Virgilius' rough treatment of the sinners, he's very kind towards her. Sharon is cute, letting a child drive a bus is a pretty novel idea. Surprisingly, there are a lot of memorable supporting characters. Romer is one of my favorites. She's the antagonist of Canto 3 and is Sinclair's nemesis. She's charismatic and has that Yandere charm. She definitely put some holes in my brain, I love seeing fan art of her. She's mesmerizing despite her limited time in the story. Dong Rang is a major character in Canto 4 and is amazing. There's a lot of subtleties to his character and the way he develops is something to behold. He's a character that's kept me thinking about him. The gameplay is kind of like an extremely simplified version of Ruina. It has skills you'd expect from that game, but without the deck building elements. Every identity has a set of three skills they can use, but skills they get to choose between each turn is chosen randomly. Honestly, the combat here is very easy so far. You can auto battle through everything if you have properly leveled characters. This is good for doing your daily tasks. You can knock them out without thinking too much about it. Aside from the story, you have the daily battles to get resources to level your characters up and threads to improve your characters or ego. There's the mirror dungeon, a short little dungeon to go through to get points for the battle pass. There is at least a second mirror dungeon that's a bit longer and gives even more battle pass points. They're both very easy and don't require much thought. They very recently released a hard mode of this dungeon, which lives up to its name and makes you need to put a bit more thought into battles. The other challenging thing they've had is the Refraction Railway, a kind of limited time event. It's a rush against strong enemies where you actually have to put some thought into it. The battles themselves aren't super hard unless you're trying to complete them as fast as possible to beat your score and earn rewards. This is where the fun came in. Figuring out the best strategies and identities to take with me to win as efficiently as possible. It was fun. Battles in the story are easy, but they can interrupt the pacing. It feels like you'll constantly be facing the same mobs of enemies using the same strategies to beat them. This was the only problem I had with Kanto 4. There were a bunch of back-to-back -back battles against the same enemies without any narrative progression, which got tiresome. It reminded me a lot of early FGO, which had the same problem of having too many filler fights that served no purpose. I've touched on this before, but the characters you use are versions of sinners from other realities. You have things like W Corp Don, Seven Association Otis, and R Corp Rabbit Heathcliff. Basically, the characters you know, but associated with a faction you may know of, and with the skill set you expect from that faction. This is justified in the narrative, as the bus has a mechanism that allows the sinners to tap into the abilities, but they also fossed as a crazed, rancid cult leader. This is the kind of fan service I'm here for. You have each character's unique ego that you can choose between as well. These are like super attacks that you can use in battle in exchange for resources you gain in battle, and sanity. Identity and ego are two things you'll be trying to get in the gacha system. I know that the existence of gacha will ward off many people. Gacha doesn't have a good reputation. It's exploitative towards people with gambling problems, and is commonly known for being stingy of rates for getting what you want. The irony of a company whose previous games have criticized capitalism only to create a gacha is not lost on me. I won't defend the gacha, but it does feel like an afterthought. What I mean is, it feels like it was designed as a single player game, but they decided to tack on a gacha element to maybe make more money. What's funny is you hardly even have to engage with the gacha. There's a resource called shards that each sinner has, which you can use to buy that sinner's identities or ego. You gain shards from getting duplicates in the gacha or from grinding in the mirror dungeon. Shards are so easy to get that I've gotten a lot of identities and ego from just that, without having to roll for them. You get the stuff from just playing the game. This doesn't make the gacha element completely forgivable, if anything it makes it feel unnecessary. At least Project Moon is pretty generous with giving out Lunacy, the currency for the gacha. Presentation for the game is pretty solid. The character designs are fantastic and the CGs are excellent. Their direction is a bit different from Ruina, it's nice and can be very colorful. 
The battle of sprites look cool. I really like how enemies explode like blood pinatas when you kill them. The Millie and Project Moon collaborations return. Those original Millie insert songs, all of them so far have been stellar. I love Between Two Worlds, which is a song about Sinclair. You may wonder if you can play Limbus without knowledge of the previous Project Moon games. The answer is yes. The developers intended to be a jumping on point of sorts. It's a way of attracting new people to their games. The story is more standalone, with new players being in the same shoes as Amnesiac Dante, needing everything explained to them. There's even something called Dante's Notes, which are like encyclopedia entries about the world written from Dante's perspective and limited understanding of them. Returning players will have greater appreciation for the setting and will recognize references to previous games. If anything, I'm glad this game seems to have caused more people to try Project Moon games. In summary, I think Limbus Company is a fun, albeit flawed game. Project Moon has been very receptive towards fan feedback. It has come a long way since it launched. I think the negative parts of the game are to be expected. This is the team's first attempt at a game like this. They keep improving, and I'm sure the game has a bright future ahead. I'm always excited for more story content and seeing what new identities will be available. I think Limbus is worth giving a try, if you can get past it having gotcha elements. It's free on Steam and mobile devices. I hear the mobile versions aren't too stable, so playing on PC is the way to go if you can. I put an embarrassing amount of time into it, and it'll only get higher. That about wraps up every Project Moon game and web series. This was quite an odyssey. Hopefully it served a purpose. I didn't expect the video to turn out this long, but there's a lot to talk about. I hope I was able to share my passion for this weird and niche series. Looking forward to seeing what the future holds. I know they're constantly working on Limbus. It will only get better in time with future updates and story parts. I really want a distortion detective game and whatever other original projects they might be planning. If anything I said about these games has piqued your interest, then try them. All the games I talked about can be found on Steam. Rune and Lovecorp go on sale pretty frequently, but even at their base price, they're totally worth it. Big thanks to my good friend Chestnut Rants for editing the script for this video. If you've made it this far, thanks a lot for watching.